Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nikon Creators Hour. I'm your host, Mike Corrado, and I'm with Nikon for over 35 years, and I've been taking pictures for over 40. And we're bringing you these really cool conversations that we're having with photographers during the Creators Hour. And today we Williams of Newsday on Long Island, a photojournalist who I've known for decades. John, welcome to the Creators Hour. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. It's an honor. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nikon Creators Hour. I'm your host, Mike Corrado, and I'm with Nikon for over 35 years, and I've been taking pictures for over 40. And we're bringing you these really cool conversations that we're having with photographers during the Creators Hour. And today with us, we have Mr. John Williams of Newsday on Long Island, a photojournalist who I've known for decades. John, welcome to the Creators Hour. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. It's an honor. It is, it's it is. our honor, thank you, and thank you for putting together a collection of images, as you know, and those of you that have been tuning in before, we put together a, a repertoire of images within the career of a photographer like John, and he gets to talk about them, but the challenge is we have them call it down to about, you know, eight to ten images or so, so we're going to talk a lot about the backstories of these images, John, and, you know, we're, <laughs> we're no strangers to each other, we've known each other for decades yes. when I covered uh, Newsday, back in the day as a pro rep for Nikon and uh, we connected and it's so good to see you and your smiling face because I guess uh, through the years I've seen you from time to time at Mets games and at concerts and we get to uh, connect but it's nice to connect with you here today so right, thank you for right. coming. We've done lunch a couple of times. <laughs> and yeah. we'll hopefully we'll talk a lot about the history and uh, yeah. it's funny when we reconnected uh, for this interview talking about uh, the Mets playoffs back in the day. <laughs> uh, and us walking out together at the end of the last game when the Mets oh, kind of yeah. blew it in the seventh game against the Cardinals, and a lot of lot of epic memories together, and we'll talk about all that. But uh, yes. I really love to get these things started so the audience has a sense of where you've come from. The very first time, think about you picked up the camera, and tell us a little bit about that journey and how you've gotten to be, you know, uh, the journalist that you are, and uh, and this is your career. Well, I was going away. I was eight years old. My, my family was sending me to a, a camp, a Galway camp. Uh, I think it was called Camp Joy at the time. And my uncle gave me a camera to use. And the camera at the time was this. I love it. And uh, that was my very first camera. And uh, I went to camp and I took pictures, knew nothing about photography. And that one picture came out. Didn't know what a flash meant, didn't know what it did, any of those things. So years later, uh, photography was pretty much out of my life. But my brother was coming to New York. Um, this is after I graduated college. My brother was coming to New York to, uh, to uh, because he lived in Milwaukee for Christmas. And I said, oh, I should get a camera that I have for memories. So I bought this camera. And uh, it wasn't a Nikon at the time. It was an Olympus on one, on one at the time. And I bought this camera and I started taking pictures and I just couldn't stop. And it was very expensive because I didn't know how to develop film. I didn't know how to make prints. All I did, all I knew how to do was shoot pictures. And that's what I did. So one day I came home from work one day. My mom was sitting down at the table looking at my pictures. And she said to me, John, you are so talented with that camera should think about doing this professionally. And I said, wow, you know, and uh, it was something I would have loved to do, you know, professionally, but how do you become a photojournalist, you know, and I still go back to school and study. So I read the newspaper and I saw a story and the story was about a local politician, Joe Maggiata, Maggiata. he was going to be sentenced by, um, fraud and extortion. He was a local politician. I said, I should go to that story and shoot it. And so I did. I took my cameras. I ran over to the courthouse and the place was filled with people. I mean, people were everywhere, journalists. And as I walked through the door, everyone turned to look at me. And so everyone knew each other amongst, and none of them have seen me before. Well, this little old man comes walking out to me and he says, are you a freelance photographer? 
I've never heard the term before. So I just said, yes, I'm a freelance photographer. And he says, well, we need a freelance photographer. And, and he says, I work for UPI. And it rang a bell because not long before then, I just got finished reading the book, The Shooter. And it was about David Hume Kennelly and his life as a photographer growing up. And uh, he talked about in the book how he went, came to New York. He's from Oregon, I think. How he came to New York to get a job with UPI. He didn't get the job. And he talked about, you know, working with Larry DeSantis for the interview and the whole bit. Anyway, I got to talk to Larry DeSantis. this on the phone that day my very first day shooting a news job so he explained to me what he needed and uh, he sort of painted a picture he says when Mr. Maggiata comes out just show his disposition is he going to be happy is he sad and all of those things he was describing to me and I said wow this is amazing so he painted this picture I had it in my head I went out to, to shoot the story and we were inside the hallway of this courtroom. And as people started filing out of the courtroom because it was, it was over, they were actually passing by me. So I had to step out of the crowd and let them pass. And so finally he came through and the whole press corps just circled him. And I was no longer inside that circle anymore. <laughs> you were on the outside now. I was on the outside. And there were like layers of people. And I said, how am I going to get a picture of this? So I hail Mary the camera and just kind of shot. And back then it was film. And uh, I hail Mary the shot and I'm firing, firing away. And then they finish talking to him and he comes walking out and I'm following him. And I mean, there must have been about 30 people, at least 15 of them photographers. Big story. Right. It was in the middle of the winter. There was ice on the ground. One of the photographers slipped and fell down. And we're just chasing him to his car. Once he got in his car, everyone stopped chasing him because his car drove away. Well, I chased the car because I knew the car couldn't get out the gate because there were a string of cars out there. So I ran after the car. And once his car stopped because of the cars in front of him, I knocked on his window. And I said, Mr. Maggiata, can I take your photograph? And he said, sure. And he rolled his window all the way down. And I started firing away with him and his wife sitting in the car. So I walked back to the press car and they said, what did you do? I said, I knocked on this window and asked him, could I take his picture? And he said, sure. And they said, you did that? I said, yeah. And he allowed you to take the picture? I said, sure. That was my first story from there. And what a great start. Yeah. What a great, great start. So for those of you yeah. out there that don't know UPI, that's United Press International, one of the biggest agencies at the time along right. with groups like the Associated Press. Those are the two big powerhouse agencies back then. Right. And um, I love that uh, you were that ambitious to try to follow up. I, 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 and again, this is your self-assignment. You kind of went out there and all of a sudden, it sort of snowballs into this beautiful career for you because someone needs you to be a freelancer. You're learning on the fly, which is right. great. And right. then just being polite and asking to have a photo taken you know, or asking someone to pose for you and they open the right. window and say, yes. And that's, nobody else got that shot. No, exactly. So exactly. Yeah. That's, that's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. That but, was um, so, start. so you didn't start a young, did you self teach yourself photography then? Did you, you learn along the way? I did. Mm -hmm. I taught myself photography. I did take classes for how to develop black and white film. And mm -hmm. actually the black and white film teacher, taught color and I wanted to get into his class and he didn't want me in his class. And I really didn't know the reason why. And the girl that worked at the gallery where I was taking the class, he used to like her. And so he used to confide in her and he, she told, she would talk to me, but she went, he went to her and say, that guy, John, he's a really good photographer. I said, I would never tell him that. And that's the way it started there. And so, but I did learn black and white, which was very important for me to learn if I was going to get any kind of work at a newspaper because I had to develop my own film. Yeah. How do you, how do you end up, how do you land at Newsday before we start showing you pictures? How do you fast forward to you get this job at Newsday? 
Right. I was freelancing for them for, for a long while. Uh, and uh, my, my name became sort of a household name in the, in the building. Uh, everyone was talking about my pictures. And a great friend of mine today who was director of photography, Jim Dooley, called me into his office one day and asked me, was I interested in a full-time job? And I said, yeah, mm -hmm. this would be my life, you know. So that's how that happened. Yeah, I know Jim Dooley very very well, and I used to call in the paper and call on you guys back in the day, and uh, right. uh, on the Nikon account, and it was really really great. And again, mm -hmm. I, I can't wait to get to these pictures, so let me start to uh, light these up and launch the show. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you again for putting this collection together. I know it was a bit of a struggle, and I've gotten yes. that from everyone we've asked. But now you've got some really deep stories to talk about here, and I'm going to let you take it away. Start talking about this first image and how you got to it what this was. I think it's pretty obvious to most people, but um, talk talk about it. Well, I was uh, on my way. We sort of enterprise when there are no assignments given to us. And uh, I was driving down Meadowbrook Parkway on Long Island. And as I was driving, I saw this column of smoke coming up. And I don't get to shoot uh, spot news jobs very often. And so mm -hmm. I, I love shooting spot news. And uh, I saw this column of smoke and I said, let me find where the smoke is coming from. And so I did. And as I got there, this house was uh, um, engulfed in, in flames in the whole bit and, and firefighters were fighting it. And uh, so um, I came across this moment and I, I was standing there as things kind of calmed down. I was standing there just looking for a picture because a lot of times photographers if you don't step back and take a look at what's going on, you miss a lot, you know? When you keep the camera up and you're firing, firing away, I find that for me, uh, you miss a lot. You have to step back and, uh, I, I, and, and look at what's going on. And uh, this fireman came by the window and he stopped and he just took this look out of the window. And the way the light was striking him and it was just, I just framed them in the, the window and the smoke behind them and I just I had no idea that the portrait was going to come out as, as, as it had um, I just knew to get that picture to get that moment and uh, I really never could read my photographs too well I just think it's a great moment and I submit them and then when people react to pictures um, as they did to this, uh, I said, really? Oh, wow. You know, so, um, so it was a great moment. Uh, the, uh, this gentleman looking out the window, uh, this fire. It, it seems like it's in your DNA to tell stories, to just sort of dig a little bit deeper in, in this kind of stuff. When, when you're out as a journalist, do you have a series of lenses that you go to? Are you zoom person? Are you primes? Are you, how, what's your typical package of lens focal lengths when you go out? I, I, generally, uh, I generally will use a um, the 14 to 24 millimeter lens and the 70 to 200 because um, I'm either very close or, or, or uh, with a wide angle or I'm, I'm shooting telephoto a lot. Uh, I, I really love both those lenses. And uh, I, I believe this one was shot with the, the – um, the 70 to 200 millimeter lens. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Beautiful picture. Beautiful picture to start off Thank with. You. And again, like you say, sometimes you just don't know how people are going to react, but right. I love it. I mean, I love the framing. I love how he's looking and you know, it just, it's really, really beautifully done. Now yeah. this, uh, I love this picture and, and this will strike a lot of conversation of our history together. Yeah. Um, as we have covered horse racing for many, many years together. Yes. But um, talk about this picture, how you came to it. I know you did a lot of sports. When you said before that you didn't typically do a lot of spot news, that's because I've seen you at Mets games and Yankee games <laughs> yeah. and horse racing events and, you know, playoffs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but talk about this picture, where it was taken and under what circumstances. Okay, this is the Belmont Stakes and uh, it was a triple crown. And I've been covering the Belmont for over 20 years. And every year that Newsday gets hyped up about a triple crown and, um, and it doesn't happen. And it's right. like, you almost will believe it's not going to happen. You know, it's like, 
you don't even bet on the horse that they predict the win simply because it hasn't happened for so many years. Right. And uh, uh, Newsday wanted to take things a step further, put remote cameras in the ground, uh, because the last couple of years, I think we covered, we didn't use remotes. And uh, so they asked me to put in the remote and, and I said I would. And uh, you get there that, that day before and you set the cameras into the ground and you, and you hope everything is positioned correctly. And then the day of the race, you get there like seven in the morning and you check it out and the whole bit. And then you shoot a, a race prior to the Triple Crown race to make sure everything's in focus and everything's right. Mm -hmm. And photographers, um, there are a lot of photographers working and man, they're constantly checking their cameras. I don't mm -hmm. have that kind of make, make up. Once it's set, I, I just leave it alone, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. and it makes me uncomfortable. It's like, sh am I missing something? Should I be checking, you know, what's going on here? And so the Triple Crown finally came about. And uh, as you can see in the background, the place is just filled with people. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to show all of that. I did not know what to expect in terms of the uh, would the horse have a big lead, would be a close race, or what it would be. And uh, I, I, I just say I got lucky, you know. I just got lucky with this moment. And uh, this was the first Triple Crown, I think, in over 20 years, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, you always want to shoot an event, and a big event, and get an iconic photograph of that event. And that's rare to combine the two, you know. You could be at the event and you get something that's pretty good, you know, but to get a really wonderful shot of that event is, is um, it feels really good, you know. It, it's a strong storytelling picture. Now, the background of all of this, if you don't know what the Triple Crown is out there tuning in, it's the Kentucky Derby. Then you've got the, um, the Preakness Stakes in Maryland, so the Kentucky Derby at Churchill Downs. And of course, it's always great for us, John, because June is in New York at uh, in right. Elmont at uh, the, right. the racetrack. And you want to know why this picture disappoints me? It is a great picture because I was in Argentina at the time, and this oh. brings back. Uh, it's a very interestingly cool memory of waiting decade. I, I, I shot uh, horse racing for almost fifteen years, waiting yeah. for a triple crown. It just doesn't happen, right? right? And we've had opportunities come by, and and horses don't win that third leg. And uh, days before the Belmont Stakes, Nikon commissioned me to go work on a TV commercial in Argentina. And, you know, you, don't, you want everybody else to experience the good things, and you don't want to miss this opportunity. But I love this uh, for a number of reasons. The remotes, you see, folks, that when you come to the track, uh, almost a line of, what, 50, 60 cameras uh, right. around the finish line, and then they start to roll into the turns. And they're triggered remotely. So that's the beauty of this image is really you have to wait to get the camera back to see, you know, what it's about. Uh, but it's a very epic moment. And uh, fortunately, uh, with Justify several years ago, I did get the Triple Crown finally. Right, right. But, uh, but I, I love the whole um, the, the sport of horse racing. And Turn 4 has always been my favorite place because that's where they position to come hit that stretch. But what right. a beautiful picture, John. And uh, Thank you. Again, it, it just reminds me of those times we're out there together. You yeah, know, like you say, you got to get out there days before and you got to set the remotes the day before and all kinds of rules. And you got to bag the cameras because they they wash the track. They wet down the track every time. Right. You know, it's a new race. Right. So you can't get your camera splattered with water right. uh, unless you have a crazy guy that takes the rakes and just rakes over all the cameras. I've seen that happen before. The other uh, thing about it, too, is because you're shooting remotely. You, you don't really know what you're going to get. You, you know, the image in your head of what you want to get but you don't know if that horse is going to be there and things are going to happen at that moment, the camera in which the angle is made and the point in which you have to photograph it. And shooting remote, you have to, especially with digital cameras, you have to be careful not to shoot too early because if you go through the buffer right. and the camera shuts down, you're going to miss that horse. You know, Remember those so, days when there was very, very little buffer and you really had to plan it out? Now it's right. so much better than the past. Right. It's a lot but better than the past. come a long past. way, yeah. Yes. But the, yeah, you're right. And, and that's, it's happened to photographers. You know, it, and this is a part of the ritual of setting remotes. You actually get a colleague 
to stand in the place where you think the horse is going to be so you can focus to that point because you're not mm-hmm. going to auto focus down the track right right um right. so you know to get the photo and and to get it this pristine you make it look easy with uh, this photo <laughs> but it's not that easy well no right? it's not easy especially if you're not only shooting this picture you're also shooting with your camera you got a camera right. in your hand so yep. you stepping on the remote trigger with your foot <laughs> and you're shooting with the camera as well you know so it's a lot yeah. to think about yes and especially when you're working for the newspaper and some of the magazines have a crew of like five or six to ten people so they've got someone pushing the remote button um, right. and you're doing it all on your own so yeah you do really it really beautiful right. but uh brings thank back you. a lot of great memories john yes it does thank you oh, i love this picture it just seems so peaceful where are you what are you doing how'd you take this photo why again it was another day of enterprising i went out looking for a picture and uh uh, this has been t- this was taken in Long Beach, and I was walking along the boardwalk, and I was waiting for the sun to set. But what was nice about this day, the whole sky was colorful, and I just just didn't expect to get a good picture. And I was just looking around, looking around, looking around, and I'm walking down the boardwalk, and nothing was showing me anything. And then I see this gentleman out on this board paddling paddleboard. And I said, oh, if I can get to the right spot at the right time, this would make a great picture, you know. And so I got down on the beach and I was running through the sand, trying to, my old butt, you know, trying to get down to the end um, just to get in position, maybe to get him and the sun in the background. And uh, I did get there in time because he was just coming out of the water just Mm -hmm. prior to this. But what makes me like uh, this picture as well is the fact that uh, not only you have a great backdrop, I love the feel of the water. You have this little gentle wave there, you know, and uh, it all just fell together so nicely, you know. It sounds like you're always on, though. Like if you're not on an assignment, your mind has to be thinking about some kind of picture you could be making for the paper. Is that what happens? And how frustrating is it at times to think, yeah, I didn't get down there in time or you miss the opportunity. How do you deal with all that? Well, it comes through experience. And I'll tell you, when I, I used to teach, and one of the things I used to say to the students when I would teach, I would say, you know, I would bring my work into the office and the editors would look through my work and say, wow, this is a great shot. Oh, you did good here. Oh, this stuff came out wonderfully, you know? And you're sitting there thinking, really? You should have seen what I've missed. You know, because you <laughs> you always miss something great, you know, and uh, as a photographer, you're always trying to prevent that from happening, you know. So I I try to stay ahead of the uh, uh, the game, so to speak, you know. Yeah, no, I understand that because there's something within the chemistry and the emotion that you have when you do know you miss something, but you got to kind of let it go. And uh, we were talking about uh, John White before, and uh, he mentioned this in his interview for the Creator's Hour, is that mm-hmm. uh, if it's not in his camera, then the, the incident didn't exist, and the moment didn't happen. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of play uh, towards that. That's, but, uh, that's a good way to look at it. Uh, yeah, but it, it sticks with me. It, it, it does until the memory's gone, but it sticks with me. You know, it's funny. It's, uh, yeah. And I, it's funny gone too. by the next day. It's to have the freedom of enterprising, you know, uh, photographs of those types of moments is far different than the Belmont Stakes because I wanted to mention too, people don't understand. Like you say, we get to the track early in the morning, right? That day of the race, probably right. 6 a.m. So you could beat the traffic in the park. Right. It's hurry up and wait all day long. You shoot the undercard races and then, you know, of course, the stakes happens two or three before the end or one or right. two before the end. Right. But people don't realize you and I, would be typically sitting there for hours and hours after that race transmitting pictures. And then That's once right. the, once the arena, the, the, uh, the track is cleared and people are long gone, we're walking out there in the dark and a little bit different to have the enterprising opportunity and be a little bit more relaxed, but there's right. a little bit of a burden. One is to get out there and make a picture you just don't see coming. The other one is to cover the story and take That's it right. to the end. And then you're, right. you know, you're up until midnight transmitting images. Right. Um, I know this is part of a series of images, John. So talk about this and the impact of these photos. And um, what's the backstory to this? Well, uh, 
Back in 2004, a reporter and I were sent to Rwanda to do a story about 10 years after genocide. And uh, so we went all over the country uh, talking to people about what it's like to live 10 years after genocide. Um, what's interesting, you know, there are killers, people who killed people. Uh, there was, it was the Tutsis against the uh, Hutus. Uh, actually, the Hutus were doing the killing and, uh, and they were trying to get rid of all the Tutsis. And so it was mass uh, genocide and, and uh, it was a hard story to shoot in that. It was very emotional because we met with both the victims and, and, the, and, the, uh, and the people who did the killing. Um, a, lot of, a lot of them are in jail now and uh, um, for their crimes. It's, it's sad that there were people who did killings uh, killed other people simply because they were going to be killed if they didn't. People rape women simply because they had to, otherwise they would have been killed. So anything uh, the Hutus demanded another Hutu to do, he would have to do it, otherwise he would be killed. Um, what's interesting, these people today, you know, going to supermarkets or uh, walking down the street and they see the person who killed their family. You know, it's like, how do you live with that? And uh, so it, it's very, very interesting. This particular photo is sort of a memorial and there's a lot of these around Memor our, our Rwanda. This is inside of a church where a lot of killings took place. And they set up these memorials so people do, cannot say that this had never happened. When I went down and they showed me this, uh, when I got into the church, there were a lot of bodies that they have uh, dug up from mass graves and, and were cleaning them and the whole bit. Uh, um, and when they brought me downstairs to see uh, this, this, it was pretty black. It was dark. It was in the cellar. And um, I used to always follow National Geographic and what their photographers would do in situations like this. And I had a, a, a flash that I kept in my pocket that I used to light uh, this scene because it was just pitch black. There was no ISO to, to match this. And um, so I figured if I can light it properly, it can be a very interesting picture, you know, and it's, it's just, it's just bring sadness. It just, you know, I don't look at these pictures anymore um, because of the sadness um, that you feel. I was going to ask you about the, I mean, you can't just walk into there emotionless. You see this and it's got to impact you somehow. And that's got to be a very, very difficult picture to make. It, 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 it was, it was very difficult. I mean, and there were, there were shelves of these. It wasn't just this one level, there were shelves of them. And um, yeah, it's very emotional. Um, it takes, it kind of takes the wind out of you when you see this stuff. Now, the this camera, is of, oh, go sorry. ahead, John. No, the you camera, go. The camera is an amazing thing. Um, the camera tends to separate me from a lot of what I see and witness especially the most horrific things that I see and witness. I can go to work and, and do the work and I'm almost shielded. You know, there's this protection I have with this camera. And um, that's what it was like taking this picture here. You know, um, you focus to try to get it right um, and you want to get out of there, you know, because you just, the heart's so heavy, you know. What I was going to mention before that you had said uh, earlier that this is part of a series of images we're going to show now. And you mm -hmm. had just mentioned that you photographed uh, things like this, but the families as well. Talk about this picture as part of the story. This is a very interesting uh, story. Uh, this family who survived 
um, the genocide. This woman who's in the foreground, and I photograph her this way because um, um, she was in the church, in the Catholic church, and she removed herself from the church simply because um, what the church did there. And the church, church allowed a lot of the Tootsies to be killed. And it was so upsetting to her. She removed himself from the church. She is now a pharmacist. And this picture was taken when we met them. She was the only person in this family employed. So she was, she's 27 years old there. And she was taking care of her family with her job. And this is taken outside their home. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful moment. Now, you're working with the reporter. Is the reporter bringing you to these stories? Are you finding them on your own? Or is it a combination of the two of you working uh, together? That, that, this particular one, the reporter and I, and I went to, there are some pictures that, yes, I had to go out on my own to, to, to find. Yeah. Beautiful. And uh, this is another part of the series. Talk about this as it plays into the story. And, yeah. and correct me if I'm wrong, but you mentioned that this won the Pulitzer for Newsday. The part of this essay was part of a bigger story and Newsday won the Pulitzer. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this, this is, this, I was alone. I, I had left early in the morning. This was like um, just as sunrise. And this is a sort of a portrait of a woman on her way to the market. Um, and she has goods that she's carrying on her head. And you notice she has farming tools. And so she also uh, goes to work as a farmer. And uh, this is kind of typical uh, thing to see in Rwanda early in the morning. You know, you'll find kids walking uh, to school with, with water, bottled water in their hand because they don't have the water in schools. Um, and you'll find women going out to work and balancing material goods on their heads and carrying. And you drive up these roads and you look around and you ask yourself, where did they come from? Because you've gone for miles without seeing a dwelling, you know? And it's like, and how did these people do it? You know, and uh, very, very, very strong. But this was a foggy kind of morning. And I just saw her and I asked the driver, just stop. And I just wanted to get her as she walked. And then uh, we drove up with her and, and spoke with her. And she talked to us about what she was doing that morning. Mm. I was going to ask if you communicate with a lot of the people that you're meeting and photographing and hearing their stories along with taking the pictures. Yes, you do. You, we, we have like people who can speak the language with us all the time. And, uh, and we do ask questions and talk to them. Uh, yes. Do you, did you do a lot of assignments out of the country for Newsday? I can imagine you're probably not doing many assignments now uh, outside the country. But well, what, 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 where they could, again, seeing you as that sports guy, they came to you to go to Rwanda. Um, how often does that happen? Well, it used to happen quite a bit. I did a lot of work in South Africa during, uh, uh, during apartheid. And I was back there. After apartheid, um, I was here in, in Rwanda, and I did a lot of work also in Sudan as well. Um, so those areas were pretty much the areas that I, I pretty much covered out of the country. Been to like Haiti, uh, covered, you know, the earthquake there. Yeah. So that's what makes it really difficult to pick pictures, you know, yeah. uh, for this. Yeah, because of some of the many things you see. It affects you profoundly. Um, you don't know how much you are affected. Um, uh, you wonder, you know, sometimes I think I need to sit down with a, a therapist or someone to help me reach some part of myself um, that I haven't touched in a long time. Um, and why I say that, because, you know, certain things have happened in my life that, that, emotionally was very deep and I wasn't too profoundly affected by it. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's because I've seen a lot of death, um, hardship and things like that. So the job can affect you that way, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Understood. I mean, these are some pretty serious stories to tell and uh, uh, amazing. And thank you for sharing the backstories on this series of this essay. Sure. Something a little more fun here. Uh, yeah. Outdoor jumping pools. Yeah. Uh, talk about this image and what brought you to this image, John. It was a very hot day. And uh, I, again, I was out enterprising and I said, let me go to a local swimming pool and see if I can get something fun because they wanted to show kids cooling off or people cooling off in a hot day. And I, and I went to the swimming pool and I got permission to go in and photograph the kids. And what we generally do also is once we photograph the kids, we get their names and we get their phone numbers so we can call their parents to get the okay to use their pictures um, because of the way the world is today. Um, but I came across this kid and he was doing all these different dives off the, off the diving board. And I just stayed with him just to get the right moment. And this picture just kind of reminded me of Iron Man when he used to fly through the sky in that movie. And I said, you know, he's just got such great form here, the way his arms are back and the whole bit. But the amazing thing is the light coming off the water, which kind of put the icing on the cake for this photo is that's why the underside of him is blue, you know? So it was, you know, another inter inter enterprising moment there. I love that. And, you know, it, it makes me think too, it's, you, you, again, we've been friends for years, but I always, every time I get the newsday paper on Long Island, I look for which photographers shot which pictures. Talk a little bit about that first time you had a picture in print in, in a moment like this and, and you see your name connected to the photo. Um, how does that make you feel? It's a great feeling and it doesn't grow old. You know, it's, it's, it's funny, even to this day, you know, I've, I go through the newspaper page by page to see if I have anything in print. You know, it's, uh, it's the greatest feeling. Um, I remember my first story with UPI and them sending me back some of the stuff that did get published. And I was uh, so excited about that. Um, even that night when I heard the stuff was going on the wire, you know, I, I uh, kind of shook my wife awake to tell her, you know, I, I'm, I'm published, I'm published. So it's an exciting thing. And uh, I remember when I first got my first cover at Newsday, and it was a story about people holding hands around the world. And I can't remember exactly why everyone was doing it. And it was a chain across the whole country. And it started down in lower Manhattan in New York City. And I had to, I had a really interesting picture with confetti flying all over the place at the moment everybody was holding hands. And that was my first cover. I never got rid of that cover. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great moment. So it's a great feeling to see your name under your picture. Yeah. Beautiful. And this, this is a really fun picture. And it did scream summer and heat and cooling off and, and tells that, uh, that amazing story. All right, so here we go again. Different, different photo, different place. What's happening yeah. here? This is in South Africa, and this is during, during apartheid. It was a very scary time there. Um, I, I had people say, oh, you're a black guy. You're going to South Africa. You're going to be fine, you know. And little did they know, and that's not the case. Anywhere you went in South Africa, if you didn't have a fixer with you, you could be killed in, all, in either black community the biggest, um, uh, the biggest um, rivalry, so to speak, uh, was the the Encadas and the uh, ANC people. The I and I and F, I think it's called. The, I can't remember the what that stood for. Um, um, it'll come to mind. I can't remember what it stood for. Um, this is, but oh, the Encada Freedom Party that's what it is, the Encada Freedom Party and the ANC, the African National Congress, which Nelson Mandela was a uh, um, leader of. Um, Booth Lazy was the leader of the, 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 uh, the Zulus, these were Zulus, and this was in KwaZulu land in Natal, and this was at a funeral. And these two factions would constantly fight, black on black. 
And the Zulus were being supported by the Dutch, the minority whites there. And I guess they didn't want Nelson Mandela to win the presidency. And so they were trying to get um, the Zulus the upper hand um, in this situation. But this was at a, at, at a funeral and there were some scary people, you know. Uh, they would march through town with these spears and clubs and at a moment's notice they would they would be at war fighting and when i was in that area we were looking for conflict we were looking for the trouble that was going on between the two and the and the fellow who who uh, who was leading us around to show us the areas where these confrontations were happening were actually taking us on a on a car trip to some of the popular areas in town. Like he would say, this is our swimming pool. This is our, and we weren't very happy with his help. So we had to leave. And on my mind, I was still saying, I have nothing about conflict, about these problems that they were having with one another. So I was in um, Port, Port Elizabeth, and uh, that's the southern part of, of, of um, South Africa and doing a story there. And I said to myself, I needed to go back to Natal. I got very sick. I got so sick that mm. I was in the 90 degree weather wearing a bomber jacket and I was freezing cold. And people were looking at me like I was out of my mind. They were wondering what was wrong with this guy. But I had to get on the plane. I had to fly back there and cover this funeral. And uh, I always try to immerse myself, even though they may be danger. I try to immerse myself so the viewer can see what it is I'm seeing and how, like this guy holding this spear, you know, um, those eyes. And uh, the gentleman behind him, as he's looking at me, these people don't know who I am. And I traveled alone, you know. I was going to say, of, no, no fixer on this one. No. And it's kind of a no-no, you know. I had to ingratiate myself with these people and try to get them to trust me without them being able to speak English and me speaking their language. So it was a risky situation with this. And uh, I saw this guy with the spear, and I kind of got really close. This was shot with, I think, like a 24-millimeter lens. And... Uh, and I got this moment, yeah. No, it, 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 it certainly tells a story. And obviously better than the swimming pool in the better part of town. Um, <laughs> yes. But do you look back at pictures like this, John, and say to yourself, maybe I shouldn't have taken that chance, or it was well worth taking the chance to, to get an image like this? That's a good question, because I have looked back at it, and I – and. I do say I was sort of a foolish man for doing some of the things I've done. I mean, they would march right through town and close streets down. And I would stand in the middle of the street and let them march past me, taking pictures. And, and it came to my mind, I said, one of them could put one of those spears through me. They didn't know who I was. I could have been lying there dead or bleeding out. And as their parade passed by, I would have been the, the only person lying there on the ground, you know. So I, as a young photographer, I, I took a lot of chances. And with God's blessing, I'm able to tell it, tell a story about it. You know? Well, I'm, I feel blessed to be here with you right now talking about our <laughs> stories and, and your pictures. we got a couple more moving on, John. These are beautiful mm -hmm. images, all of them. And thank you for sharing these stories. This looks like a great, beautiful moment yeah. here. Yeah. This was uh, called a Mayafa ceremony. Uh, this is a local church in Queens. I think it was in Far Rockaway. Every year they would come down to the, to the beach and uh, worship their ancestors who died uh, on their trip from Africa to, to America. And that's what the ceremony was. This was shot at at dawn it was pretty dark out there and i was working with chester higgins from the new york times he was out there shooting and he had an assistant and his assistant was holding a a, a flash 
And Chester and I were shooting the same picture. And since the exposure was long, I was able to catch his flash. And I was able to get this lit image like this. Nice. So you got a little assist, unexpected. Got a, yeah, got a little assist. I knew he was shooting, and I was hoping for it, but I didn't think my timing would have done it. But mm -hmm. uh, it did work out. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Early on, you said when you walked into that courtroom for your very first self-assignment, you know, they didn't recognize you as part of this journalism pool that typically shows up to different things together. Sounds like now, obviously, you're at that party career. John Williams walks in, and there's this camaraderie of, of photographers in town or the, the various papers that come together. We see them all the time at Mets games or, mm -hmm. you know, those times we're shooting sports together. So it's far different than when it started, huh? Right. It is. It's much different. Yeah. 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 We all know each other and we all help each other out. And uh, it's, it's a great group of, group of guys out there working, and girls. Beautiful. You know. Yeah. You got one last image. Now, I know mm -hmm. we're, we're dealing with the pandemic, right? And yes. then we're brought into, you know, um, the George Floyd uh, killing. And now you're shifting gears and covering protests as well as the pandemic stuff. Talk about what you're doing these days. Uh, definitely the backstory in this picture. I love this photograph. It's so powerful. I had seen this on your Instagram page and I was hoping you put it in the collection so we could <laughs> talk about it. Yes. Uh, talk about what you're doing these days and covering, you know, uh, what's going on with uh, COVID-19 and, and certainly the protests. Well, for me, it's uh, very scary times uh, because of the COVID um, pandemic that's going on. Um, I've had uh, a good close friend uh, um, die from this pandemic, and it's, uh, it's a very scary situation that I take very seriously. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work with that. I've been uh, going to testing sites and, and photographing people being tested and, and the like. And, um, and myself just trying to keep safe, you know, washing my hands all the time, wearing a mask all the time. Mm -hmm. Then when the Floyd story broke, um, I wanted to be a part of it. And sort of the risk of doing that and the pandemic, that pandemic for me became secondary. I was willing to take some risk to cover this because I thought this too was very historical. And um, I remember on a Monday, it was about maybe two or three weeks ago, after this broke, I went into the city to, to, on my own just to take pictures of protesting and, and the like. And then that next day, Newsday sent me out to, uh, to do more of it. They were happy with the stuff I had, had done. And this was at, this picture was taken at a rally um, in Brooklyn where uh, Floyd's brother was uh, there. And I think his brother lives in Brooklyn, but they had this big rally. The mayor was there. A lot of, a lot of people were there. And um, I'm always looking for this symbol in a great moment because I remember when I was a kid and I was watching the Olympics in 68 and uh, two Olympians, um, uh, John Carlos and what was he? The Tommy, I can't remember the second, but they raised their fist in victory. And uh, I, that as a kid was so, so powerful. And it meant so much to me. And it, it, it stuck with me all the time. And when I saw this fist up the way it was, and it was all alone, and and I see in the background heroic men. I just had to get this shot, you know, and uh, it just symbolized that moment back back in 1968. And it's 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 a symbol that Black people have used um, over the years during protests 
or when there was just injustice to to black people, that fist would go up, you know. And as a photographer, I wanted that fist, you know, because it was just symbolic, you know. It's a beautiful capture, and and like I said, it's a very simply shot photo, but so powerful. So, so powerful. Thank you. So I can almost feel you in that moment, seeing it, seeing the background, seeing the words in the background, mm -hmm. just enough depth to feel lost to make it there. And, and it's prominent enough. Uh, but the strength of the closed fist is just really, really powerful. And uh, I, I assume when you mentioned the, the friend we lost, Anthony Causey is who you were talking about? Yes, uh, Anthony from, Causey, yeah. Yeah, and uh, those of you tuning in, Anthony Causey was, as we spoke about that, those groups – of photographers that come together that you would always see at a Yankees game or a Mets game or, you know, a football game. And, and you, it's, it's a camaraderie, but I guess there's, there's a lot of families that are created from uh, all of this. And um, so it was very sad and, uh, to see Anthony pass uh, because of COVID. Um, but it's, it, it's an amazing <laughs> time that we're in. And that's what sort of kicked off the need to, to, to do this creators hour in these interviews. So I'm thankful uh, that from some of the tragic things that are going on, we've had these opportunities and we're starting conversations again that we need to continue. So yes. thank you, for John. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing yes. um, and bring you back to full screen. Now, okay. the last thing I want to talk about is I think something that's very interesting because you and I have a mutual friend who you work with, uh, Bill Perlman. Mm -hmm. right. um, so we'll give Bill a little shout out. Bill is one of the editors for Newsday and he's constantly posting pictures of his little desk space in his home <laughs> where he's actually producing the newspaper, right? I know right. a number of people are coming together. Talk about this experience. You're not going into the office anymore. You're not dropping film off. You're not transmitting from home, um, you know, uh, but you guys still build a newspaper every day that exactly. I see you know, delivered to, uh, to my place. So talk about that experience. It's, a, it's very strange uh, 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 because of the fact that you don't get to see the people you work with anymore at, at, at all. You know, it's, you, hear, you talk to them on the phone and uh, you, it's, it's a little disjointed because um, it's difficult for, for Bill to say, talk to John Keating. It's not like if you need something in a, in a right. flash, you can just look over across the room and say, hey, I need this. So everyone's talking via telephone, you know, and I guess this sort of a Zoom setup they have as well, like they can see each other that way. Mm -hmm. But as a photographer, I think photographers are kind of lonely people, as it were. I mean, you're sent out to do stories and uh, you send your work in and since your work is so personal, since it's, it comes from your heart, you're always looking for good feedback. And a lot of times in these situations, that feedback doesn't come. It's okay, thank you, and they move on. You know, so everything is just moving so, so quickly. And you, you're left with this emptiness, you know, and you have to, which I've done for a long period of time, you have to remember to shoot for yourself. You know, shoot for you. And if you have great standards, they're going to love what you do. You know, and that's what I say to myself. You know, make images that you're really going to be happy with and, and leave it at that, you know. And so that's way, the way it's been. And it's, um, it's even more lonely without having that relationship with the office of being able to go in. Now, there's times you're happy to be <laughs> not going in the office for the most part. You know, it's like it's great to be out in the street. But, you know, there's always that calling. There's always, let me go into the office and see what's going on there. You know, and mm -hmm. Newsday has a brand new office. We have a brand new office. It's a beautiful office now. And uh, so going in there is really a wonderful thing. But I have to com commend Newsday for, um, for getting the paper out, for keeping the paper moving the way they have, for making sure that their people are safe, for taking steps in towards our safety. Um, and I'm, I'm happy with that. You know, they, you know, they set rules in the beginning when the uh, pandemic was hitting strong, they did not want their people to get sick. So they put uh, rules in place for us to go by. And, and so we did, you know, and, uh, 
also being kind of a uh, a person who wants to try to get everything right, you you're almost ready to break the rules, you know, because you want to try to do something better than what you can do, you know. So, but uh, it, it's the pandemic, it's a very serious, this COVID thing is very, very serious. And I hope people are taking it seriously. And you know, yes. um, the more they do, the faster we'll get on the other side of it, you know. You're absolutely right. And I, again, I can't thank you enough for sharing your images, John. And this has been a treat for me because, you know, it's like we're kind of out to lunch or we're not, but um, but it's great seeing you. And it just reminds me of so many great times we've had together over the past decades. Thank you. I, I enjoyed this. Very nervous. But <laughs> I can't tell you how nervous I have been. Oh, but, God. Uh, you, you're fine. I've never, I've never been nervous around you, Mike. I tell you, I, I, we, we laugh all the time when we're together. <laughs> we do. We do. It's a, you know, it's it's a way to pass the day, and again, I'll I'll never forget that story coming out of that last playoff game of the Mets, and it was sad because you tripped over the railing with a six hundred millimeter lens. As I'm exactly. I'm carting my you know gear out in its bag right. on the roller wheels, and I'm carrying one of the chairs because it was the very last game that said Mets and Nikon on it. In fact, right. I can't not show you this. This is, oh, this okay. is the, do you remember when we put those chairs in the wells yes. and Nikon sponsoring the Mets, but. Exactly. I totally understand, and I certainly understand your sentiments about Newsday because Nikon's yeah. doing the same thing. Um, came out of Creators Hour wanting to inspire, so that's why we're doing these types of interviews, and, and especially with photographer like you, great, great time. Um, very safe. They're they're concerned about our safety first. So you know, thank God for companies like that, and and that we've still been able to 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 work. So thank you for giving us your time this morning, John. This is a great, thank great you. hour. And, and thank you so much. Is- you're welcome. The creative hour has been very enriching. I mean, people watch it. It's just, it's just very motivating, especially to other creative people. So it's just lovely to see what's out there. Great idea. Thank you, John. And okay. thank you guys for tuning in. Um, again, if you've missed anything that we've done through the Creators Hour, go to NikonUSA.com backslash Creators Hour, and you can see some of the past interviews and what's to come throughout the, the rest of the month of July. Um, We want you to be inspired. We want you out there taking pictures. So please, as we start to roll out of the pandemic, hopefully continue in the direction that we're going into the different phases, that you get out there, take pictures and share them with us. Look at what we got going on online and engage and and, and have a great time. So for Nikon, I am Mike Corrado. Thank you guys for tuning in. Everybody out there, be safe.